Good evening. Turn to open your, bi your songbooks, number 469. That'll be our first, our only song this evening. After we sing this, this song, we'll be led in prayer and we'll be dismissed to class. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, James Herring, if he will, to lead us in prayer after this song. Uh, and if he doesn't hear me, poke him for me, Susie, whenever it's time. <laughs> number 469, two announcements. The announcement sheet's there, it's complete, and it was accurate when it was printed, but there will not be a visitation for Norma Jackson now. And so no visitation for... That's wrong. Okay. 6 to 8 tomorrow? I call Mark after that word. Okay. So now the word is 6 to 8 tomorrow at Greenwood. Norma Jackson's visitation will be 6 to 8 tomorrow at Greenwood. And um, those of you who knew Cheryl and Roger Omer, Cheryl has passed away. And her funeral, I understand, will be at 10 a.m. tomorrow at the Western Hills Church of Christ building. Uh, and there weren't enough people to eat our stew. There is a lot of delicious stew left over. So please get yourself a nice big, is that gallon baggies, I think, something like that? Get yourself a nice big bag. Yes, ma'am. The people in this area might know the name. Of course, we know the name Spurlock, but sure. a co-worker, real good friend of Ron, Ronnie Spurlock, passed away this past week and his funeral was today. Okay. Anybody that went to Rebecca, she so. So Ronnie Spurlock has passed away, and the family. He is the great nephew of W.G. And W.G. was a, a charter member here, right? Yeah. And always sang out, I understand. Always sang out. On several keys, but he sang Well, that's all right. That's all right. Yes, Tom. Oh, yes, Tim and Lee Duncan. That's right, Tim. Uh, Tim has been diagnosed with a colon rectal cancer that has metastasized to the liver. Mm. So it may even for okay. a car or whatever. All righty. Tim and Lee Duncan. Uh, Tim Duncan uh, is a former member here. Uh, they were members here for uh, a little over a year, maybe two years, while uh, he was... They were here for the first time, and I believe that they are members of uh, Church of Christ over in, uh, to the west of us, uh, Oak Ridge, I think, Oak Ridge Church of Christ. Okay, well, we'll keep all those things in mind. Uh, there's nothing for you to pray about. Uh, don't forget any of that in prayer now, uh, but, but all, uh, seriously, none of us, let's forget these things in prayer. Let's remember them in prayer. Number 469, help us get ready for the lesson, and after this song and prayer, we'll be dismissed to class. Encamped along the hills of Lychee, Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the falling veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh, glory has victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given, been to the angels he shall know, his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, the hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world.
Dismissed to class. Let me invite you to turn to Romans chapter 3 this evening, Ch chapter 3 of the book of Romans, beginning at verse 21. We'll be there in just a moment. Make sure you have a handout for the lessons uh, this evening. This is lesson number 5 in our series on faith and doubt. It's a series that uh, has been authored by Roger Shiflett, and we appreciate Roger putting this material together and that we can consider studying it this evening. Also wanted to add one other person. It seems like we've added quite a few this evening that have passed. Uh, many of you uh, have former Sunset members, and many of you in the community here on the west side might remember the name Bobby Houck. Uh, passed away on Monday. And saw that on Facebook, I believe it was Tuesday, yesterday, posted by one of the boys. Uh, Bobby, pardon? Yes. David and Darren, he was the owner of City Roofing and uh, attended Sunset. He attended Western Hills and uh, was very involved. Uh, before we had youth ministers, <laughs> youth ministers, we had men like Bobby Houck, so he was, he was very good. <clears throat> Have you ever discovered that you possess something of great value and didn't know it. Margaret denies and says no. <laughs> Have you ever discovered that you possess something of great value and didn't know it? Okay. Yeah, possibly. All right, compassion, friendship. What else? I usually found the opposite. Something I thought was a valuable antique was a piece of junk. <laughs> <laughs> how many of y'all, by the way, how many of y'all watched the Antique Roadshow on PBS? I think that still comes on on Monday nights. It used to also come on on Saturday afternoons. Uh, my father-in-law enjoyed that show. He would watch, he'd make sure every Monday night he'd set his t TV to Channel 13 to watch the Antique Road Show. And if you've ever watched that show, yeah, there's some things of great value. You may, may think, well, that's a, a piece of junk. But then the antique, uh, in, uh, the individual in, involved with the antiques had a great story about it of historical value. Oh, this, 
this piece here goes back to the 13th century. And <laughs> yeah, and then you find it's duplicated somewhere at, uh, one of, <laughs> at Hobby Lobby. <laughs> Uh, but I'll go back to what Ronnie said a moment ago about our companionship and friendship that we have with people. How does that make you feel? Makes you feel good. What else? That's right. Something of value that's yours, that you uh, uh, can enjoy and possess over the, over the years. Makes you feel safe. Absolutely. Well, what do we find here when we look at Romans chapter 3? It's not a, a, a pretty picture. If you look at verse 21 beginning there, Paul writes, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as the propitiation by His blood to be received uh, by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sin. And finally, verse 26, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, you'll remember here just a while back, I think it was back uh, last year, we took our, one of our small group sessions and studied the book of Romans. What do you remember about that book, especially in regards to question number one, the first two and a half chapters of Romans? What kind of picture is painted by Paul there in those first uh, couple of chapters? It's, it's dark. It starts off first with uh, those being condemned, being the Gentiles. But then the Jews are, are, are saying, well, look at them. Look at us. Paul says, well, look at yourselves too. You're just as guilty as they are. And that's why Paul makes the conclusion here in Romans 3 and verse 23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then he says later in Romans chapter 6, what? Regarding sin. The wages of sin is death. So Romans is not a pretty picture. What's the basic message Paul is relating to here, not only from the first two and a half chapters of Romans, but also from what we just read here in Romans 3 and verse 23? What's the truth we find there? We're all guilty. Now, what's the difference in that and what some religious people are saying today, that you're born into sin. Where do we draw the line there? Sin is an action. Can a little infant sin? No. And you think about these young children today. What they do, they don't know what they're doing. When do we understand what sin is all about? Is there a time, a certain period in our life that we understand and realize what sin is? Pardon? As soon as you learn about it. What do we call that? The age of accountability. It is. We have some today that are mentally challenged that may not understand that, may never understand it. Mm 
Say that one more time. The ability at the right at that time to understand that. I'll throw that out for consideration. I don't know if I can. Uh, what What do you think of Ronnie's statement? Well, I think that virtually everybody that would do something for others would be Exactly, exactly. So for the people down through the centuries, including the several billion who live in our world today, what significance does this great truth have for people? What, what's the message we need to tell the several billion who live in our world today? They need help. They need help. <laughs> Uh, class is yours. That's it for the. <laughs> that's the. Well, that's a good statement. They need help. What kind of help do they need? They need spiritual help. They need to sit down with someone to be taught of the Word of God, so that they can understand that the message that you are not right with God. Yes. Yeah, I would tell that same person, hey, I was in your shoes. And I, I still am in your, your shoes today. We still sin, exactly. So what, what's the message that they need? They need the gospel. The, what is the gospel? The good news, but also the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I thought some of our students would pop up and answer that question. <laughs> that was something drilled in our heads in Berlin, New Mexico, <laughs> yeah, those that went on the campaign with us, because you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and you see what the gospel is. Paul explains it to you. But yeah, it's good news, no doubt about it. To know that Christ died for my sins, that he died and was buried and he rose again, that's good news. So look at, let's look again at verse 26 here in our reading tonight, Romans chapter 3. Look at that verse again. Paul says, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Now, look at your question. Given that sin is universal and sin has consequences, what dilemma does that pose to a loving and holy God? God does not want anyone to perish, but all to come to an understanding of the truth. What else? Yes. There is... Uh, where, where does that punishment lie? And where, where? With us? How are we punished for our sins? Death. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and God told them what? You're going to die. This paradise is not forever anymore. It's come to an end right here and now. And therefore, you're going to have to die. But I've got a remedy for that. Satan, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to crush you. 
And when, when did that take place? At the resurrection. That's when Satan was crushed, bruised, destroyed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ because Satan could not keep Jesus in the tomb. So we have a loving and holy God who does not, as Margaret said, does not want any man to perish, but for all to come to the truth. We have, a, we have give, been given to us a great gift. What is that gift? Salvation. How do we get that gift? Well, we have certain things that we have to do in order to receive that gift. How many of y'all have been given, by the way, a gift in, in your pa past? You've won a free prize. Say you, you uh, won something on the radio station, like a free record album. Uh, yeah. Well, I re but I remember my brother uh, won two prizes from the radio years ago. He won a record album from KXOL, and he also won free tickets to a football game. But in order to get those prizes, what do you think he had to do? He had to go get them. Nowadays, they mail them to you or something like that. But in the past, you had to go and meet the obligation of picking up the prize in order to receive it. So there are sometimes, in order to receive a gift, certain stipulations. To receive salvation, there are stipulations. Those stipulations are what? Hear the word, believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, repent of your sins, confess his name before men, be buried with him in baptism for the remission of sins, and then raised to walk in newness of life by walking in the light as he is in the light. Look at number three. <clears throat> and if you do, go back, we'll go back to verses 21 and 22. How does Paul introduce to us God's dealing with the problem of salvation? Go back to verses 21 and 22. What's the dilemma here? What's the situation? How does, how does God introduce it to us? The righteousness of God has been manifested. And what's that word manifest mean? Pardon? It's been revealed. It's been made known. How does the law and the prophets testify to God's righteousness? Let's take it one at a time. Where do we find God's righteousness revealed through the law? Yes, number one, sin is identified. Again, a need for a remedy to that as early as Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Where else do we see that through the law? Yes, Abraham believing the law and counting, counting it as righteousness unto him. Do we have the righteousness of God revealed through uh, Moses? Where? Pardon? All right. But what, what specific example? The commandments. Not one revealing, but twice. <laughs> Remember, he broke it the first time after seeing the golden calf. All right, and that brings us to our next uh, part of this. The prophets. Isaiah, for example. Isaiah 53 is a good example. What, are, where do, what do we find in Isaiah 53? By the way, it's also revealed for you in Acts chapter 8. The lamb that is led before the, the slaughterer. The sheep before the shearer. Philip the evangelist taught 
the Ethiopian eunuch from that scripture. And when you teach that scripture, what are you also leading it to? Baptism. No doubt. Philip led the eunuch to baptism through that scripture, through that reading of Isaiah 53, because the eunuch said what? See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, if you believe, you may. He said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The two went down into the water, and the two came up out of the water. The eunuch arose and rejoiced. Philip went on his way to do more work for the Lord. But even the prophets reveal the righteousness of God. So, look again at verse 22, because that'll be for our, our next question here under number three. Go back to ver uh, verse 22. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. So the, the question here is this. Where must God's righteousness and man's faith meet. It's got to meet somewhere. It's met through Christ. Because Christ then and therefore becomes the centerpiece of the whole picture. God in his righteous love toward us sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. We must have the faith to believe that. Hebrews 11 and verse 6 tells us what? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For we must believe that he is a what? That he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. That's where it meets. It meets right in the middle with Christ. So there's that word that we see here in, in our reading tonight, and it's in verse 25, by the way. Paul writes, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. God set forth to be the propitiation of, for our sins. What is that word? What does it mean to you? What is propitiation or a, I'm not going to try to say it, I may bungle it, a propitiatory offering. <laughs> best, best I could do. But what, is it, what does that word mean? Appeasement, all right? Is that you, Rick? A trade-off. Our sins versus, uh, in, in, in lieu of what? Okay, it's a solution. Yes, I was trying to get Rick to finish his statement there for me. For the blood of Jesus and his righteousness. Chris, you were going to say something. This word, every time the word, the mercy seat is mentioned in the Old Testament, this is the word that is translated between Septuagint and verse 95. Wow, yes. So this is the mercy seat of God. The mercy? Is the mercy seat the place of the blood that sprinkled for the sins of redemption? The mercy seat was the propitiation. But what's another good example where we see that word propitiation? Could we use that word in going back to uh, God's people in Egypt? What was the last plague that God put forth there in Egypt? What was that, John? The death of the firstborn. In order for the Jews to have been spared of that, what did they have to do? 
they had to, number one, take a perfect lamb, what was called a paschal lamb, a, without spot, without blemish. And certainly eat of the flesh, but take that blood and put, put the blood where? On the doorpost. When the death angel passed over, if the angel saw the blood, what happens? You're spared. You're, sp you're saved. We could see that in, in a similar vein as to what we're talking about here, I think, in, in question number four. There's another example. Hopefully it's to what we're talking about here. You remember what happened when Moses were, were with the people and they were sinning and they were being bitten by vipers, the poisonous snakes? What was the solution there? What was the remedy there? Yeah, a snake's likeness on what? A brass pole. Put that on the pole... You look at the pole, you see the brazen serpent, and you're saved. So we see several illustrations in the Old Testament, besides the cross in the, in the Gospels, regarding this salvation. Salvation through the blood in, in, in Genesis. Salvation through the blood on the, the brazen serpent. And salvation through the cross. Number five. In the case of sinful man, an offering was required. Who provides the offering? God. Who was the offering? Christ. To whom was the offering offered? All right. What does Paul call this in verse 24? Say that again. Redemption. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, 23, 24, and are justified by his grace. As a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. God has given us redemptive qualities. God provides, provides the offering. Who provided the offering for uh, Abraham and Isaac, you remember? God did. Notice there, notice at the cross, God provides the best offerings. The offering was Jesus Christ. It, it couldn't have been just any man off the street. You know, even there was a man that volunteered to carry the cross the rest of the way because Christ was so physically worn out and tired he couldn't finish it. But it wasn't that man that was put on the cross for the salvation of our sins. It was Christ. To whom was the offering offered? Now, to a lot of people, the Jews thought, well, the gospel's just for us. But what does he say here in our text? There was no distinction. That was the big problem here in Romans was for those within the church that thought, well, it's just the Jew only that's receiving the gospel. No. The Gentiles just as eligible for that message and that gospel. Go back to Acts chapter 10. Who was the first Gentile convert? Cornelius. A Roman and from that point forward, we see more and more Gentile converts. But 
Paul calls this a gift and redemption. Through the redemption that is, that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Salvation through faith. What role are you seeing here in this lesson tonight that faith is playing in regards to our salvation? How important is that faith? Very. Very important in what way? Again, absolutely. Without it, you're, no, you're going nowhere. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. In what sense has God passed over sins? That phrase, passed over, we saw pass over in the book of Genesis when the lamb passed, or when the angel passed over and saw the blood on the doorpost, there's safety, security. What has God done here in passing over sin? Through the blood. How important is, is it for us to have the blood of Christ? God shed his blood. We are washed in the blood of the Lamb. No, I don't see blood in that baptistry back there. All I see is, is water, H2O. What is that water and that blood? What's the relationship? Yeah. When the Roman soldier went to the cross took that spear and thrusted it into the side of Christ, the Bible says two elements flowed forth, water and blood. Those two elements are commingled, mixed together. And again, physically, you do not see that up there. But it's pictured and resembled in the Scripture. So if we come in contact with the blood of the Lamb and we are raised to walk in newness of life through the blood of Christ, by the blood of Christ, God has passed over our sins. Just like the angel passed over those in, the, in Egypt who had the blood on the doorpost from the sacrificing of that lamb, who that lamb, by the way, was a type of what? A type of Christ. A type of Christ. Because that lamb, like Christ, was without what? Without blemish, without spot, without stain. Jesus was tempted at all points like we were, but yet was found without what? Sin. Part two of the question here, number six. By its very nature, what does sin deserve and require? What do we all deserve here tonight, sitting in this auditorium? Death. What does sin require? It requires forgiveness. It requires a remedy. Sin is what? Could we say sin is a disease? It's a what? It's an impurity. Physically, you come up with illnesses and impurities in your body. What do you do? You go to your doctor. Uh, and what does your doctor generally do? 99% of the time he's going to give you what? He's going to give you a pill. He's going to give you a prescription that you've got to go 
uh, take care of at Walgreens or CVS. Uh, you know, it may be a temporary supply, maybe 60, 90 days, whatever. But he's got a remedy for you. What's the remedy for our sin? The blood of Jesus. Amen. Sin deserves death. Sin requires a remedy, a solution. And that solution tonight is come to the cross of Jesus Christ. Come to Jesus. He will save you, though your sins as crimson glow. If you give your hearts to Jesus... He will make it white as snow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as crimson, they shall be as, as white as snow. What about the leper we read about in the Old Testament? He had leprosy. What was he told to do? Go dip seven times in the Jordan River. Not the Arnar, not the Parfar River. Though those were close to his hometown, be, he was told to go to the Jordan. And he dipped himself not once, but seven times. On the fifth time was he clean? On the sixth time was he clean? How about six and a half? Do I hear a seven? <laughs> On the seventh, he came up with his flesh like that of a young baby. Last question here. Number seven, how then does God resolve his dilemma? What's the dilemma that God is dealing with here? Sin and the condition of mankind. The welfare of man is not pretty. He has sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of his sin are death. But God has resolved the dilemma. How then does God resolve his dilemma and provide that way or that means whereby man can stand righteous and justified? How then does he do it? He does it by what? By Christ. And he does it by us doing what? Living by faith. But even before that, what do we have to do? We have to believe and we have to be baptized in order to remove that sin. And Ron, you mentioned it a moment ago, we still sin. What's the key to that? 1 John chapter 1, walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Walk by faith. Walk by faith. Walk in that light that he's provided for us. There is salvation through our faith. We need to have that faith in order to please God. We have to obey God through faith in order to be saved. Any other thoughts that you might have tonight as we close? Because again, I'm going to get you out 15 minutes early. Actually, it's about 7.46. So. <laughs> yes. Right, there's that wall. That's right. I remember, and everyone here in this room will remember because it's happened in your lifetime, two things. Number one, after World War II, uh, there was the decision made to build a wall in Berlin and separate the two, East and West Berlin. And, and it was that way through the 80s until Ro President Reagan told Gorbachev to do what? Tear down this wall. And once the wall was torn down, there was no, no, nothing to 
uh, block or bind or, or anything. The separation was, was uh, completed and everybody could have freedom amongst themselves there on both sides of the city. And just like what Leslie said, it's what also the prophet Isaiah has said in the scripture. Your sins have separated you from God. And it's like that wall that's built up. God said, I, I would love to reach out and, and help you. But I can't because sin is that blockage. The only way to tear down the wall is come to Jesus. Amen? All right, next week, lesson number six, the response of faith. Chris, would you lead us in a word of prayer as we close? Lord bless you.